you've gotten the uh, cross pieces in, they've all lined up properly, and you should be able to take your straight edge when you get done and line it up across the front two here on F3 and F4 and lay it like that and bend it down. It should line up on your back end back here. It should, should fit just properly right back there. When you the next thing you need to do is need to put the, our sheeting on the top. And if you, the sheeting on the sides, you'll notice the grain goes this direction, okay? on both sides. Now whenever you do the top or the bottom, the grain needs to be different. Um, I know it'd be real easy to just lay a sheet on like that and just maybe like put two sheets together and then just stick them on there and line them up and then glue them in. But that doesn't work and the reason why it doesn't work is is that the um, by that I mean the remember we're doing the shear webbing on the wing where the strength is in this direction of the wood but it's not really strong in this direction in the, uh, the pull apart direction, which is cross grain. Well, the same thing's with the fuselage. If you put the wood on like this, you'll be able to twist the fuselage a lot easier than if you put the wood on this direction. So basically all you do is straighten out your edges, make sure you get nice clean edges on both sides of, of your piece of long piece of sheeting. And then you cut pieces that are just rough cut and take your saw and just saw off pieces and until you get filled up all the way to the back end. We placed our sheeting on the back. We have the cross grain going this way. We also did the bottom side also. We, I remember I told you this, this front had a big piece of plywood. This whole thing in the front is all plywood, all the way from the firewall back to where past where the landing gear goes. Then we have the rest of this is all of our sheeting. We uh, did our, where we did it before, we glued it all on, um, cut it off, and then we sanded these off flush. And we just uh, took our heavy sanding bar and then our fine sanding bar and smooth this all down and we get it it should it should be pretty smooth when you get done now in the back here where we come around the end I just bent a piece of uh, wood around and just kind of bent it around the bottom there just so it would make a smooth contour into the back piece so it would be smoothly contoured back there and then I just flushed the whole thing off and any lines that I took off I put back on like right here you can see where the line came off and I had to put it back on up in the front, we had our plywood piece we put on, got it all on, sanded, everything flush, and your fuselage should work out, on this model anyway, the same size as this piece of plywood, if you did everything properly with your fuselage formers and everything. And we, what we did here was I measured from the firewall back to a point, and this is the point exactly where our landing gear needs to go, and our landing gear will go on just like that. Now notice the landing gear is straight across the front and it's beveled in the back. You always put the bevel of the landing gear on the back side. That puts most of the weight of the landing gear towards the front and, and keeps our weight forward. So just remember that when you put it on. Also right here, I put a little mark. I measured with my ruler exactly where the center of these two holes were and put a mark right, right here on the, on the uh, metal. And you can see that mark and that's the center. That will go right there, okay? We just line up the mark with our center line and put it at, at the where we drew our line across where that has to go. Now, we took a little triangle and we laid it on here so that it went on our center line and laid out so that our landing gear would be perfectly perpendicular to our fuselage center line and then I just marked a little hole. And now we'll do the same thing as we did with the firewall. We'll drill a hole the right size for our 440 screw that has to go through the whole landing gear on, then we'll mount that one screw, okay? We'll put that on, put the blind that on backwards, whatever we have to do, and then we'll recheck our alignment, make sure it's all square and everything's proper, then we'll drill, we'll go all the way across and we'll drill this hole, put the screw in, tighten it down, put this screw in, tighten it down, put this screw in, tighten it down, so that we know all those four screws are going to line up properly. You can go to the inside of the fuselage and uh, Basically, before you drill the holes, what I had to do inside here was I had to put a, a larger piece of balsa wood in on this plywood piece, and then I had to put another plywood plate on top of that, and that's, that'll be the piece that our blind nuts actually get sunk into. Sides here just straight, and we need to round that somehow. Um, there's about only one way that really works well that I've ever found. Now let me show you on these drawings what happens. If you look at this drawing, you can see that this is what we started off with. We started, this is our fuselage side and this is our top. It could be the top or the bottom, but the grain runs crossways on the top and the bottom and it runs this way on the sides. Now, flushed it out even with the side of the fuselage and that's what we have now. 
The second thing we need to do is we need to take our large sanding bar and try to hold a 45 degree angle and then sand the fuselage side straight so that we sand that down to the point where we just start seeing our quarter inch balsa of square sticking through. And you can see it pretty easily because usually the wood is three different colors and it'll make a little, want a little line of quarter inch balsa sticking all the way down. And you try to keep that line the same width all the way down your fuselage so that you know you have the same amount of wood taken off all the way down the fuselage. And that's not too hard to do. But try to make it straight. Use as much as the bar as possible. Use your big bar. After we get done with that, next we need to round that off. And you can see we have to round that off and we're going to take a little bit of the corner out of this quarter inch piece of balsa wood here. And uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, I'll show you how to do that here in just a second. I've already run things and I'll show you exactly how we do that. But uh, I, know I put tape up here also so that I wouldn't sand the wing saddle. So I have tape right from the back edge here. And you may want to do that in your airplane too. Uh, let me turn over here and show you what we did on the bottom here. You can see that right along in here I got a little bit of the black line showing, which is a little bit of black line of the printing, which shows I'm all the way down through into the other side of the wood, and that's on a 45 degree angle. And we just took our big bar and just sanded that on a 45 degree angle until we got something to show. Now if you look real close here, you can see, you can see that little tiny piece of wood right in there that's the quarter inch square I was telling you about. And you want to come right to that here. So if you look real close, you can see that. Um, some of the sanding, if, you, if you're lucky enough to live out in a, uh, a warmer climate in the winter, you can do some of the sanding outside in the picnic table, or you can, uh, uh, it's just nice to be able to get outside and let some of the dust blow away. But try the fan, and I'm, I hope you notice too, we're working on our foam now, because we're dealing with sheeting. Now, the way you get this nice round contour up here is no big mystery. It's, it's a lot of people have a lot of trouble doing this, and uh, let me show you an easy way to do it. What you need is you need another another piece of foam. This is just a piece of square foam, and what I like to do is I like to take the the I'm going to do the bottom side down here, do a section to show you. But you sit back in your chair and you place the foam against the table on an angle so that you can hold this between your legs, and you can brace up against it and press on it. And I'm going to put a dust mask on because I don't like breathing this dust, so you may have a little trouble hearing me too, because this uh, stuff is right in your face. Now, a long strip of uh, 80, 150, some kind of sandpaper, that really doesn't make a difference for right now, but uh, you just take it like this, and you can use the corner to corner, or you can use it side by side like that, and just lay it and hold it tight against the sides, and just wiggle it back and forth. It's almost like polishing your shoes, and just keep doing that until you get that contour pretty round. What you can do then is take a, a strip of 220 and do the same thing. You just want to get the rough shape with the heavy sandpaper, and then go to your finer sandpaper, and just do this all the way along. We place one of the ailerons on, and uh, I have that one finished, but I want to show you how we do that. Uh, we have to have this wire put inside of our aileron, and you can see the aileron will go on just like that, and will be almost like an exact piece of the wing when we get done. We want to leave about a sixteenth of an inch gap here so that we don't have any binding. We're going to put covering over this piece and covering over this piece, so you have to have some room in there to allow for that covering to make up some of that space in there. So about a sixteenth of an inch is about right. Uh, now. What you have to do is measure your sixteenth in this dimension. That wire has to go into the uh, aileron stock, and that's the part that will move our aileron up and down. And after you get that marked, you have to take your pin vise and drill a straight hole down the aileron stock, and drill that as deep as you need to go to get this thing all the way in. Next thing you have to do is, if you look real close, you're going to have to drill a slot, and I like using the same drill bit as I use to drill this, and just eat out a slot so that the wire that runs across back here will fit entirely flat into this piece of wood. That way you can get the stock all the way up into the aileron, and it will fit up tight up against the wood. See? It's it goes all the way up tight against there. As little gap as possible between the, the wing and the aileron itself. Let's talk about fuel tanks. Fuel tanks come in all shapes and sizes. They're all different types and brands. Uh, 
Here's one here. This is a Sullivan tank. Uh, it's uh, got the fuel tubes come up at an angle. Some come out straight out the front. Some look like milk jugs. I've seen people use uh, uh, gallon gas cans in fuel tanks. And this is the one we're going to be putting in this airplane. This is a uh, Kraft Haze tank. And I like these. You know, as you go along in the hobby, you'll, you'll find some you like more than others. And one thing to remember is that we only are going to use two pickup tubes. The lower one here is the one that's going to be going to our carburetor and the upper one is the one that's going to be our muffler pressure and our muffler pressure is always the top one on the fuel tank. When you put these tanks together we cannot have any leaks and since this is a, a, an RC uh, tank we're, we have what they call a clunk. This is a clunk. It's a metal weight and what it does is that whether you're right side up or upside down the fuel line always ends up being in the in the gas because the gas will always go to the bottom of the tank no matter whether you're upside down or right side up it'll always fall to the bottom now what's very important when you make these tanks up is that you adjust this length of this fuel tube here inside the tank so that this piece back here the clunk cannot hit the back end and make sure it doesn't hit anywhere along that arc that it that it moves back in the back and you can see that that you can check that by putting your tank together and just wiggling it back and forth making sure it doesn't hit. You want it as far back as you can get it so it'll be in the back edge of your tank, but make sure it doesn't hit anywhere and cannot grab or bind or anything inside there, okay? So we have our fuel tank made up. This has got an extra fitting in here, but this hole is not drilled through. There's no, there's no connection to the atmosphere here through this fitting. That, that's if you want to have a separate line, but normally just two tanks are all we're going to use. Uh, we don't want any fuel lines or any fuel filters or anything in this line. We just want a pure line right to our carburetor. And up here on the engine, uh, what happens is some manufacturers will, will explain it in, in their kits, but what's very important to remember is that this is the center of the carburetor, right where your needle valve is, right there. Okay? That's, that's the most important place to know about on your carburetor and when you're setting up your fuel tank system. It doesn't make any difference whether you're, you're, you're right, you have a right side up tank, you have a 45 degree angled engine, you have a, a 90 degree angled engine where the engine is actually in the airplane on the side like that. The center of your carburetor would be right here then, okay? And that's the line you use as a reference line for setting up your fuel tank. So. Um, even 45 to be more in that area. So just keep in mind the set of your carburetor is where we have to talk about. And where you set the fuel tank up is is that the pickup tube that comes out of your fuel tank has, cannot be any higher horizontally than that line. So that would be the maximum height you could ever set your fuel tank at would be that line right there going across in the bottom of the ruler. Okay? And ideally you want the tank to be between three-eighths of an inch and a quarter of an inch below that line. So looking at our fuselage, we, we would want, probably want our tank's outlet of our fuel uh, tank to come out right here at this point right there on our fuel tank. So if we put our fuel tank in there, we want to get it set so that the, the tank is just right about right in that area right there. Uh, we, we, we can't go any higher than about there maximum. We can't go any lower than about right below that maximum. I like to do things a little bit different than a lot of people. Some people will, uh, up in this area, you have your fuel tank. You want to put your battery down in the bottom here because you want your maximum weight forward and your battery is one of the heaviest things you have in your radio system. Um, and some people will just wrap their tank, their battery up in foam and shove it up under the fuel tank and it really causes a mess. You have trouble getting in and out and you don't really know what you have when you start. Um, let me show you a couple of things you can do. The first thing you do is, is your battery. This is a flat pack battery, and this is the bag that the um, oh, the parts for the, for the fuel tank came in. What we need to do first is we need to fuel proof this, because this is going to be under our fuel tank. We don't want any fuel getting into it. It'll just ruin this battery immediately. And this is about a 550 milliamp battery pack, and this is a real common battery you're going to find in most airplanes. And so we'll just take that, put it in a plastic bag, and get our cord around there get our cord coming out just kind of nicely and we'll take some masking tape and we'll just tape that shut. I've cut some foam. This foam is the shape of our whole fuel tank compartment and uh, it's about, oh this is our 916th pad, the same as it was a, sheet, a piece of this stuff and this is carpet pad and any foam will work but the foam that's about the thickness of your, your item is, is the best to use. We're going to have our battery, our lines are going to come out the back, so we'll have our, our oops, it didn't work very good, did it, that tape. We're going to place that like that. Now, look what we can do here. We can take a little piece and cut out 
a section the same size as our battery and put that just like that. Now we can take another piece and lay it on top and if everything works out right we have a, a little sandwich that will hold our battery and it, it totally shock mount our battery so we should never have a problem with our battery pack. It makes a nice neat installation. Also this will give us a nice bed for our fuel tank. And if you work out that foam right, you might want to put another little piece of foam or something in there, build it up a little higher, a little thicker piece of foam to get your fuel tank at the right height. And you can see we could take our fuel tank and stick our lines through there, really nice, through our holes where they want them to go. And the fuel tank will come out, come just about like that. Get even, nice, smooth bends, and we want to make sure that we don't. Um, chafe the, the, the fuel lines as they come through the firewall. Um, you can take a, a piece of bigger fuel tubing and stick it through there. You can take uh, silicone and silicone those things, those uh, holes when we get done. But we want that to be a smooth. I've set this up so it works out just about the right height. As you can see, it works out to be just about the right height on that foam. Okay. Now that we've got it at the right height, we place it exactly in the center of our fuselage. We can take some other little foam pieces and we'll just uh, hold it in there so it stays in the center. You may want to put a little piece around the front here so that it doesn't jam up against those bolts and s different things. I'd hate to have a, a screw punch a hole in my fuel tank. That would, wouldn't be too nice. Well, gee, since we've done all that work on the battery, why don't we do the same thing with the receiver? We know the receiver has to go right back in here somewhere. So what I've done is I've cut some pieces of foam that are, that are the same width as the fuselage. They fit right tight across the side of the fuselage and they're wide enough for our receiver to fit in. And the receiver will probably go sideways. So if this is uh, sideways here, we'll take that and I've actually cut out some little cutouts for the receiver to fit in. Now the receiver is a little bit thick for this foam. If I had a bigger, thicker piece of foam, it would work out even better. But that that will sit in there like that. That's so where I can get my servo connections into the, 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 the radio. I've also cut out a little groove in here the foam where since it's too high this will fit in there just like that nicely. We've got a few more things done. What we've done here is we've used a switch. You can do it like this. It mounts in a little holder that comes with it. And it's really nice. You just mount that in there like that and drill a hole and this fits through. This actually fits your spark plug wrench, this little uh, hex head here. And you got a little handle here. It works really nice. You can take and put your servo tray in and use a wire to run out the side. But this is a little neater installation like this. Uh, these are a couple bucks. They're not too expensive. Uh, remember that when, whenever you install a switch mount like this, that you always install it so that in is off and out is on. That's kind of a, a convention throughout the uh, RC field and anybody who puts a switch in with a wire or something that comes to the fuselage, out is on, in is off. Okay? Wire yet. We've also mounted the charging jack down below here and we've cut a little hole for that and we, we've mounted with that with two number one screws and that'll work really nice and this will be really handy when we're out the field we can check our battery condition and we can also charge our battery without having a cord we gotta go digging out all the time. Um, whenever you cut holes to the fuselage like for this or for this make sure that you treat it like glue so that it becomes tough and stiff and you will not uh, dent the wood when you put these pieces in. Uh, we'll have our covering over this and we want that wood to be nice and hard. Okay. We have to put our servo tray in, and here's your three-in-one tray system, pretty much. Uh, this radio I just bought, this Max 5JR radio, didn't even include a servo tray, and I'm kind of surprised and a little disappointed that they didn't even give you a, a little piece of plastic like this with a $200 radio. Now, what I've done is I've measured some pieces of hardwood. This is a, a, a piece of maple, and this is like 5 16 square maple, these two bars that I've made here. And I, I cut those so that they're exactly in just a tight fit across the receiver. Um, and what I've done is I fit it in there and I screwed these pieces of wood in here so, so that I, I set it in there and it was a press fit and I was able to mark the holes and drew this, uh, drill the screws in to the hardwood. And uh, remember you gotta go all the way through, drill them with your number 50 drill and then treat the holes with cyanuric clay glue so that they will become rock solid. It's almost like makes threads in the, uh, in the wood. Then, if you just took the end of the wood like this and tried to glue that into the side of your fuselage, it wouldn't hold very well. 
So what we've done is we've made little plywood gussets. And these are little pieces of scrap plywood that were in the kit, and uh, the little and they make a little tiny uh, holder for the end of the wood. And what that'll do is that'll give us a more of a gluing area, more of a surface area, and it'll hold it solidly in the side where this here would not if we had it just by itself. Straight. So uh, n now what you do is we'll take our, our uh, accelerator and pre-treat all this here. We'll pre-treat the ends, we'll pre-treat these plywood pieces, make sure you sand the plywood pieces first on both sides, then we'll fit the whole thing back in the fuselage where it has to go, and then we'll just hit it with a few drops of cyanuric light glue around here, around here and on the other side to hold it in, it'll be rock solid. Make sure that you don't get any twist, twists in your tray, make sure it sits nice and square and solidly. We also want the um, servos to be as low as possible in the fuselage. We don't want to mount it up here because it might get in the way of our, our wing or something, but we want to get as low as possible so that we get our center gravity of the fuselage as low as possible, and we want as far forward as possible without getting into the, the area of where we're going to have our receivers so we don't have any trouble getting that in and out and getting the wires connected to it. Um, another thing I want to show you was that uh, the fuel lines here, now that I'm working on these, what you need to do is you need to take a piece of uh, oh, tubing or something else and uh, like a screw with the head cut off or some other little piece of metal that you can take and plug these two together. And you want to put those together and plug them up somehow so you don't get any junk down inside these while we're doing the rest of the processes on the, uh, uh, the rest of the fuselage. As you you're take your, all the, here's some little scratches where I hit the, uh, uh, I don't know if you can see those or not, but there's some little scratches you can feel in there. I'm going to try to sand those out. And this do scratch is probably from my heavy sanding bar. And uh, if I can't sand them out, then what I'll do is I'll use something that uh, I didn't want to really tell you about, but I'm going to anyway. Because what happens is, is that I don't care what happens while you're working on this plane. You're going to be doing things. You're going to be nicking your fuselage. You're going to make a mark in it. And I got a dent right there in the fuselage. You can take and, and put a little water on that and try to uh, take a, uh, your heat iron, your, your uh, covering iron and try to suck that back out if you want. But another thing that really works well is there's a project product on the market called Model Magic Filler. And this has been on the market, I don't know, about five years maybe, maybe even longer. But uh, this stuff is really amazing. Now, this is not a substitute for good building practices. This is strictly for little dings and, and, and dents that you put in, in your in your uh, fuselage or your covering surface before you build it. And this stuff works really nice because it's the same consistency as the balsa wood, it seems like. It sands exactly like if it, if it was balsa wood. And all you do is it, it comes in a can, and you can add water to this, and uh, it, it looks kind of like whipped cream. It looks like a can of whipped cream. And it gets kind of stiff, you know, a little bit harder here and there. But all you do is, for something like that, I'll just put some on my finger, just press it in the hole, and build it up higher than, than what the surface outside of it is. Just like that. And that's all I'll basically do to that. This stuff will dry in like five minutes, not even that. And it's really nice to work with. Now, all you have to do is I did a piece up here. And what I have trouble with is, and you may find the same thing, is getting these, these cross grain sheets on the top of the fuselage and on the bottom to line up exactly with uh, each other. And I end up with a little dip there, and I just can't fill it up. So I'll put a little bit of that in there, and you can take a playing card and just smooth it out if you want, and that's what I did with that. And then just take your sanding, your, your fine sanding bar, and just what you need to do is to take your sanding pad, and this is the, the sanding pad I showed you earlier, and it's got foam on it. It's a little soft, so you can press it a little bit. So it's not, not real soft foam, but it still is a little bit soft. And this is a 280 or 320 grit sandpaper. And this is really a neat thing to, to do, because now if you sand with this, you'll find that this wood will no longer feel like wood. And this is standard woodworking practices. You start off with heavy sandpaper and work your way to the finer stuff. And you should never have to go any finer than about 280, 320 grit sandpaper. And if you just rub over it like that, you'll see some real fine sawdust come off of the wood. And this is kind of taking all the little high spots off of it that are even the sanding marks from your 220 grit sandpaper. And you'll find that this stuff doesn't feel like wood anymore. It feels almost like, oh, maybe paper or some kind of other material besides wood. Make sure that, that 
whenever you you mount these that you have the holes in the horn here lined up exactly over the center line of your hinge okay that's too far forward you probably are going to want to go about just like that and that's where you would put this that way you don't get a differential throw if you mount this back here you'd get a differential throw which would be probably more down than up if you mount it too far forward you get more up than down but if you put it right over the center you'll have an equal throw up and down what we've done is is we've I told you that we we're going to start covering. Well, we got one more thing to do before we cover, and that is do the lateral balance. And lateral balance is this way, laterally across the wings. And what happens is, is that when you start putting your airplane together, you have your motor and everything. You got your muffler hanging off on this side. You have your servos, your battery, everything maybe off just a little bit off the center. And as you're flying through the air or taking off, the gravity will affect one wing more than the other. And you can see what happens here is this wing here will drop down. Just like that, it won't stay. Well, what we've done is we've we put the, the, the radio in, we put the switch in, we put the wheels on, we've taped the engine on, as you can see here. We just got it taped on, and so it won't fall off and, and we can support it by that. We've hooked up everything we can hook up. We put the tail on, we've stood up the rudder where it belongs and just tape that on pretty much for for now what you do is you get everything put together and I have a little knife edge here that uh, I'm using to put on the little prop shaft there and that will allow the plane to to tip very easily one way or the other okay and the back I have a piece of plywood a little chunk of plywood there mount in a vise or some other thing that will work whatever you want to do I just don't want anything that's going to put a dent in my wood and this works pretty well and that goes as far back in the back as you can get in your table and you put it exactly in the center of your fuselage we need to add weight out here to this left wing tip and you can see what I have here is I've had some little nuts you can use some lead you can go buy lead you can get everything but I like just going through my junk and finding little nuts and bolts whatever I have and we'll take these whatever we need and we'll glue those inside here inside the wing and we'll put glue pins and put epoxy glue on it so that it will stay and they will never come out we also want to get them as far forward as possible so we'll glue them right up here in the front to keep our weight to the, to the front of the airplane and you can see now that, that when you when you level the wings out get the wings level and let go of it it really doesn't want to move a lot take a look at this airplane here you can see that the this one here is 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 quite ornately covered the wing and the whole tail surfaces are are covered completely with plastic film covering and all these things are possible um, this is a totally sheeted wing, so all you have to do with this is simply, I put a piece of blue up in the front, I put a piece of white in the back, and I cut some red strips and stuck those over the top, and it makes a really pretty aerobatic airplane. Um, the one reason I wanted to show you this airplane was, was that uh, this airplane here is really easy to see in the sky. And when you choose colors for your airplane, it's very important you can see the airplane while you're flying it. Now. Uh, colors like green, dark blue, light blue, those colors are, are very hard to see in the sky. So is white. White is very difficult to see. Um, in a combination color like this, it becomes easy to see because you can't mistake this while it's in the sky. Uh, also, something that's very beneficial too is to have the bottom a different color than the top. The bottom has a different, totally different pattern than the top has. That makes it very easy to see and know whether I'm right side up or upside down while I'm flying. We've gotten our tools out and one thing that's very important to remember during the covering phase is that clean up your bench. In fact, get out the old vacuum cleaner and vacuum everything very well. Vacuum all your pieces of wood, vacuum your, your, your foam, vacuum everything, even get a different piece of foam if you have, happen to have one. But you want to be a totally dust-free area when you're working on your covering because what will happen is is that if you have any dust on that wood at all the glue on the back side of the covering material will not stick to the wood it'll stick to the dust and if it sticks to the dust it's not it's going to make a poor adhesion 
to the wood and we want to make sure we have good adhesion so vacuum all your pieces of wood vacuum your, your interior of your of your fuselage out all the bays and your wing everything like that get it all vacuumed out so we need to have our tack rag we talked about a tack rag these are really cheap and get a couple of them and and before you right before you cover this surface make sure you go over it rub it down good all your joints every connection every place that that you're going to be putting covering with your tack rag and if you see balsa dust on on your tack rag flip it over to a new section that hasn't been used yet and do it again probably the most important thing to remember is that when you're covering a, a section such as this uh, horizontal stabilizer that we want to cut a piece at least an inch or so bigger all the way around in this piece because when we're trying to bend the, the, the covering over the edge we got to have something to hold on to to be able to pull on and heat and pull and that's the main goal and the main way you, you bend covering around edges and round surfaces is by heating it and pulling it and then holding it till it cools down and that's the main secret is people don't pull hard enough they don't heat it enough and they don't hold it until it is, is all the way set up because uh, it has to cool down before the glue will adhere. Uh, another rule that is very, very important is that always finish the bottom side of a surface before you do the top. And that way, when you take the section here, you'll put your last seam on, kind of on the bottom edge down here of your horizontal stabilizer, and it won't show from the top when you're looking at it. I mean, everybody wants a pretty airplane when it's sitting on the ground. so. Uh, in the air, it's too far away, you can't see it, so don't worry about it. But on the ground, you don't want to see all these seams. But, uh, that's very important. Also, another important thing to remember when you're doing covering is to do little sections first. By that, I mean, here's the ailerons. I've already got them covered. And you'll notice that this little flat piece here, I covered that as a separate piece. See how, see those? They're separate. I didn't cover them and try to bend the, the covering around the whole side here or anything like that. I covered those as a separate piece. I made a little test piece here, and you can see it's just a little piece of uh, triangle stock that I had laying around, and I put a round edge on one end so we can do a couple of different things and show you how to do little pieces of here all at one time. And we talked about doing those little pieces first, and basically all you do is just take a little piece of scrap, make sure you get the right side up, lay it on so it covers over the whole area, hold it down, Make sure you use your uh, tack rag on there first. And if you have it real sanded real smoothly, uh, you won't have any problem at all getting it to, to hold down. Then you just take it and just, I've got this iron on high now. Uh, some of these irons have high and low settings. And what you want for your little iron is you want the uh, setting so that it turns the, color, the covering a uh, little bit different color as you apply the heat to it. This red gets a little bit darker red. Now I'll just take my knife and we'll just trim it. Places like that. So okay, so we got it on there now. We got a little piece on there. Just that's all I did with the ailerons was that. Now before you go any further, make sure you take your iron and burn in these edges. Just roll these edges over the edge like that. But, uh, <laughs> Since we're going to have to bend this piece around this edge, we have to roll this edge around, I need a lot to get my hands on there. And, and, and if you have big hands, you need to put more covering around there so you can get your fingers onto it. If you have real tiny hands, uh, then you don't need quite as much. But uh, I'll probably put the piece on like that, and then we'll, then we'll cover it. And uh, let me show you that here. Let me separate the back backing from the piece. And this is how I do it so I don't mix up which is which. So I lay it down and try not to even touch the glued surface with your fingers. And I want that to go on there so I'll lay it on there like that. I hold it with my fingers. Now, whenever you're doing a surface, and I'll show you a little more on the wing, you need to center your piece under your covering. And how I do that is I just tack it in a spot. I get it best with my finger and just tack it in a spot. Then I'll go up the other side here, pull it a little bit tight with my finger, tack another spot. And then you go out to the sides, tack it, and out to the other side and tack it. That way it keeps the covering straight. The problem you have with covering is that the, you, when you apply heat to this covering and you start shrinking it down, 
you have air trapped underneath there. Okay, so you want to minimize the amount of air that's underneath that covering between it and the wood. Um, you also want to, as you apply heat to it, you're also going to heat that air onto that wood, which is going to make the wood, the air expand. And if the air expands, it's going to take up more room and make bubbles. So the idea is to try to get the air out. Well, there's lots of ways you can do it. And uh, let me show you one here that works pretty well. Uh, this end here, okay, I'm going to leave pretty much open. I'm not going to, this is the, the rounded end up here. This is the flat end. I'm going to leave that end, end open. And uh, I'm going to finish up this top part here. And uh, sometimes you have to hold on to things in different ways. I'm going to do it in my, on my leg here just so I can get some pressure on this and pull it. But you take it and pull it, heat it and pull it. You kind of heat in front of where you're working. You heat the, the covering in front of where it touches the surface. And if you do a little bit, hold it, and then move on down to another area, pull it, heat it, work it back and forth, pull it, hold it until it cools down, move on and just do it back and forth and back and forth, you'll find that you'll be able to stretch this covering over just about any surface. Uh, the process we're going to try to use here is called venting. And I don't know who invented it or anything else like that. All I know is that it works pretty well. And this by venting is meant that you, you find a way to get the air out of the covering, which means you close up three sides which we've done here. We've got this side sealed, this side sealed, and we've sealed around here because we've got this covering bent around that piece there. But you see, it's, we haven't shrunk it in here. We haven't stuck it down or anything. And this end over here is, is still open to the atmosphere. We've, we've tacked it in the middle just to hold it straight, but we could even pop that off. It really wouldn't make too much difference. But we want to have a way to get the air out. Now, if you take your heat gun and lay it out so that the pieces don't stick together pretty much, there's a couple of things you can do. If you want, you can just heat it and, and move your, your, your heat gun back and forth. And this is a little bit small of a piece to try to do it with. But you can, you can heat it and, and let, the, let the shrink the covering here, get all the wrinkles out, and move the air out this end. And what will happen is, is that covering will, will, will shrink down smooth. It'll also go right down to the surface, and it'll partially stick to the surface. Um, if you, if, this makes the smoothest, prettiest looking surface. Um, if you want to make sure that you have good adhesion all the way along, you can take your Kleenex, heat it up, and then rub it down out all the way to the end, just working the air bubbles and everything out towards the open end. Once you get that done, just seal it up. And let's do that right now. You gotta be careful when you're working with a heat gun that you don't heat it up too much. So you wanna shrink this down but we don't want to shrink it so much we start bringing a lot of extra wrinkles in there. Okay. Now that will work like that. We let it cool and it'll be, be a nice smooth surface. Or we can take our cloth And just touch it lightly and stick it down to the wood. This works really well too. And because you're using a piece of Kleenex and you're not touching the wood with an iron, you'll never scratch your surface. The only problem with doing it this way is, is that this method here, uh, this method here tends to let the grain show through a little easier than, than the uh, other method is. But if you just touch it really lightly down to your wood, geez, I, know you, I think you can even see the grain there, can't you, a little bit? Yeah. Uh, it'll show the grain through the wood a little bit. So if you do just the regular venting by not touching it, it'll just kind of float along the top of the surface and will be just perfectly smooth. I've spent approximately another five minutes working on this. You can see it takes, it does take a while, but it does take a lot of force. You can see how we pulled that around, all the way around that, that round surface, and that's, that's pretty rounded. And I made it that way for a specific reason. I got it all the way down the other side, so it's totally flat and, and bent. So you can, you can cover about anything with this plastic film covering if you take your time and heat and pull. And I was putting like five to 10 pounds of force 
on this thing, just pulling on it like that and heating it to get it around these little curves. And just heat it up like that. Make sure that the tip of the iron is over on the stuff that is not on touching the wood yet and holding it there. And then pulling it and it'll just bend right around. We're on our wing and uh, here's a little piece I showed you. I got all cut up and it looks really nice. Uh, it's not good for anything but it's something we'll just leave it there for whatever, just practice. And what I've done is I've cut a piece to fit one half of the bottom of the wing. And you always do the bottom first, like I said. And I've actually, I put a little piece in the corner here. I don't know if I can show that to you without taking this all apart, but I've added a piece right in here. And I've added a little piece right outside the aileron there, where the aileron linkage is. Because I'm not gonna be able to get the covering in there from the top of the bottom. I'm just gonna have to cut around that area and I'll just cut it here and cut it here, make it neat, okay? So I'm working on my foam. I got it blocked up to stabilize it here with my foam. And what I've done is I've cut a very straight edge across here, okay? But where I put this on, on the airplane is about a quarter of an inch over to that side. So when I put this piece on, I'll put that seam right exactly in the middle. That'll give me a quarter inch of gap where I can glue the two pieces together. Uh, down here on the end, I've left extra. You can see I got extra down here. Enough to cover over about an inch or so. There's the end. I got about an inch or so laying out. Now you're going to throw some of this away, I know, but it's just something you have to live with. And uh, I have about a, oh, quite a bit here because I have the aileron cut out where I have to run back farther and I have an inch or so in the front. Okay? Now the next thing you do is up here where the aileron wires come through the fuselage, you have to punch a little hole. Okay, and this will be our critical point for, for setting everything up, is getting that hole punched right, and you place it over there and set it down on the wing. Getting it centered, lining up your line here, so that everything works out smooth and straight, and just get it so it's all straight and everything's right, okay? Now, what we need to do is go around it in various places and tack it. And what I suggest you do is start over here, right where your aileron cutout is, and I would even tack that down and stick that down all around that area just so I don't move that as I go along because I want that to be my reference point because that point can't move or I'll be ripping that hole all up. Now you can pull it up this way from the top and tack it along this seam. Tack it in a few places here and there just to hold it so it stays straight. Okay. Now, if you, now, now that you've got this held at, at this side and at the front, you can go all the way down to the other end of the wing and tack it right in the middle down here. Go to the back of the wing in the center, pull it over the edge a little bit, and tack it. This gets it on straight and you stretch it out evenly over the entire wing surface. Now you can go to the other corners, the front corner, pull it out, tack it, let it cool down. Make sure you cool down so it gets back to the same color before you let go of it. Go to the back corner, pull it out. You need to go right in the corner pretty much. And I like going over the edge, so I'm pulling over the edge. Tack it, and then go up in the middle a little bit, tack it about a quarter of the way out from the wing tip in the back, go out in the front, just what we're trying to do is get this whole thing squared on here and it sh shouldn't have many wrinkles when you get done. It should be, you should be pulling the wrinkles out as you go along. We've gotten some more done now and uh, what I've done is I've sealed it along here and I've sealed it out about, oh, about an inch along the edge because as I start with my heat gun, I don't want this edge to pull loose. So uh, I sealed it all the way around here about an inch. I sealed this whole section back here with my little iron around the wire so that we didn't uh, have a problem with that. And then along the edge, I bend it over the front, along the front. Same thing with the back edge here. The difference in the back edge is that, remember we were talking about that back edge we had to worry about this area here? When I got to this corner, I took and cut a 45 degree angle, straight out 45 from that corner. And then I, I took the piece, stuck it underneath the, the wire here, and pulled it down, and I was able to seal it there. Same thing along here, I pulled it down and was able to uh, seal it along that also. Then I didn't, I didn't do any sealing on the top edge at all of the, uh, 
of the uh, trailing edge here where the aileron goes, I did all my sealing on the back edge here so that as I heat it up, it'll heat evenly through the entire surface and it'll shrink it down over the top of the, the wood back here and I'll get my smooth finish when I get done on this surface. I don't care if I show the grain through or anything back in this edge because that's going to be hidden by the aileron, okay? Uh, up in the corner here, at the trailing edge, what I did here was I, I cut it right along the, the, the contour of this trailing edge and it comes out a little point and I just cut it off there and sealed it down so that it would stay down. Now, when you cut this off, make sure you don't get over onto the top side. Okay, this is, this is the bottom. This is the top over here. Make sure you don't cut it on the top. Make sure you cut it right on the edge so that it doesn't show a little bump there. And I gotta touch this up here just a little bit before I go much further. I have to seal that down. Let's see what happens. We'll start over here, and we'll just start working it back and forth, shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. We don't wanna, we don't wanna heat it up so much that we start uh, sticking the covering down right now. We just want to start shrinking this stuff up and start off on your edges and work out towards the center. Let's go around, around, around. We've got this entire area here shrunk down and I know something pretty interesting was that it was easier to seal this up all the way along the edge here and work out towards the empty bays. Uh, I haven't done any covering for a little bit, and then you lose this after a while. You have to keep at it to keep uh, your, your talents up on it. And so I sealed it all the way along here, and that allowed it to shrink a little easier in this end. Um, what I'll do now is I'll take this salad piece here and seal it along almost all the way down, and then take my heat gun again and then blow the heat down this way so that we do our venting process down this way and let the air come out this end. And then we get done, we'll just cut this off cleanly right around the edge. Now when we do the top side, we'll fold that piece over onto this bottom edge here a little bit and just, and then we'll take our knife and cut it just a little tiny bit off the end there. We've done the bottom side and we finished the other side of this, uh, of the bottom here. And after I got done, I just sealed around these aileron wires pretty well, and I need to clean those up a little bit yet to make them nice and neat. Uh, if you wanted to, you could cut them neatly out and then paint inside there with some red paint if you're real particular about how you do things. Um, I don't think I ever have done that. I just make sure that they work good and nothing should get inside there. Also, when I, when I got this done around the aileron servo cut out, I sealed it, made sure it was sealed really well around here, and then cut a clean line around the around my uh, box that I made in there, okay? We did the wing tips, like I told you. We made the uh, flipped over piece, and we just cut those flat all the way along the edge, okay? Now the other side is done exactly the way the bottom side is. The, you start with going over center a little bit on one side and do this side all the way out, uh, exactly the same as we did in the bottom, and the same thing on the wing tips as you fold them over about an eighth of an inch and then bend it, heat it, heat and pull, heat and pull, bending around there until you get about an eighth of an inch glued down and try not to glue any more than an eighth of an inch. Just glue exactly an eighth of an inch down and then neatly cut it off with your knife. If you use a straight edge or some other kind of a, uh, something to make a smooth cut all the way along there. And uh, this up here you had to pull around, this is took, took heat and pull process, heat and pull, heat and pull around this corner up here and uh, it comes out pretty nice. Then when you get done with that, you just put your other piece on, go exactly to the center, and that's where that goes. And you do the same thing on your side. The covering of the fuselage is, is a little different. There's a bunch of ways you can do it, and this is the bottom side, there's a top. And what I like to do is, is I like to either cover the front or paint the, the, the firewall or something to, to seal this. This needs to be fuel proof, totally fuel proof before we start. And the easiest way to put, uh, if you're going to put covering on this, is I took those, uh, the fuel lines. We had fuel lines sticking out of here. Well, I pushed them back in to the, to the firewall just barely enough so that they would not affect the covering when I put the, I could put the covering over flat. Now I'll cut the hole where they have to go and I'll pull them back out and with a, I'll stick a screw in the end and twist it and then just pull them back out. You have to be real careful because if you shove them in you might lose them so be very careful with that. I also marked 
the center lines here, our, our, our reference lines on, on the sides, and we're going to need those because once we cover this side, we're going to lose these lines we have on here. So make sure you mark those here and here and here. Uh, you, can, you can cover the whole sides and then put the, the front piece of covering on and then overlap the, the sides a little bit. But since I'm not, I'm not planning on putting a cowl on this plane, this particular plane here, um, I'd like to do it first, then I'll bend the covering up over the side, and then I'll have a, a little ring of covering around the inside here. If you put the little ring of covering around the inside here, anywhere up near the firewall, after you seal it down, burn it in real good with your iron. Uh, I like taking some uh, cyanoacrylate glue and just gluing that edge with a real drop, real small drop of cyanoacrylate glue all the way around, just to make sure that nothing can get underneath the covering from the fuel in this area. Uh, what we'll do first is we'll cover the bottom. The, this bottom we'll do all in one piece and we'll, we'll cover it over oh about oh, a 45 degree angle into the corner maybe about another quarter of an inch over that 45 degree point. And uh, what we'll do when we do the sides then we'll actually trim off the sides on the bottom because when you're looking at the when the plane's setting up like this, you, you want to don't want to see that seam there. So the seam will be on the bottom here. Um, also, what we'll do here is we'll do the sides, we'll roll it over the top, and up in the front, we'll roll the covering up over this part, and we'll make one seam so that this is one continuous piece up to here. Um, I think what I'll do is this is going to be hard to do covering the windshield area on this plane, so I'll bring it up over here, bend it around as much as I can and cut it off. Then I'll put a windshield in of maybe like silver or some other color, maybe black, to make it look like a, a windshield window. And you can even put some windows on here. And when we get to the trim stage, I'll show you how to do the trimming. So, and uh, the bottom I think you can handle. Just pull it around, whatever you need. Uh, should be easier than most of the rest of the stuff. But I'll do the bottom and I'll show you the side. We've got some more done. And uh, what we did in the bottom was we just put a piece on laid it on there, sealed it along here, sealed along this edge, sealed the front, and then we just uh, shrunk it down, flowing the air out the back, left the back open, and we just bended it up over and, and pulled and heated this area back right in here. I cut a piece for the top, for the, the, the left side, sealed it along the bottom, sealed the front, and then sealed it right along this area here, right in that area there, along up here, and then I cut this piece off, and this piece here is still attached. Um, we sealed it up along the top edge here and I put a piece and sealed the top on the top edge and then I once I got that sealed down I cut this off so I got rid of some of my now what we can do here is we can uh, take this piece and cut off once we get done I shrunk it down again and then left the back open and flowed the hot air out towards the back I cut this off flush back here where the uh, horizontal stabilizer has it set because that's got a glue on there so we want to make sure that's nice and solid and we don't want any plastic film over that. Uh, we still have to do this part back here and do some other work. We can, if we want to, just bend this over the top and then cut it down the middle, a little bit over the middle and then our next piece that we put on on this side we could fold that up over the side and then cut that so there's a line exactly right in the middle. Um, I think I probably will do that on this plane. Uh, some planes I don't want to do that. Sometimes you want to put this piece on here as a separate piece and do the sides so you end up with four pieces on each fuselage. But remember in here we have the fin that goes in that slot and so actually we're only going to have a little bit sticking up here that's actually going to be a seam when we put that on because the, the, if we do it right and cut everything properly the seam we make should end up underneath our vertical fin and only this much here should stick out. So that'd be probably a good way to do this one. We'll put a seam right in the middle and that'll get rid of our seams along the side there. We've talked about uh, finishing this front end here and we wanted to put a windshield on. Well I told you I was going to use black. Well here's a piece of black covering and here's the way I like to do it. Uh, first I like to cut a piece big enough that it'll fit over the whole area and then I'll put over the entire piece of film covering, I'll put uh, some drafting tape. Now this is not masking tape, it's about the same thing, but it's made by 3M and different brands make it, and it's called drafting tape. And it's not quite as sticky as regular, regular uh, masking tape. So don't try to use this. You can try it, it depends on your brand you have. But some brands are real sticky and you won't be able to get it off your film covering. And what you do then is you just cover the whole thing over with it, like that, and then I'll just lay it over there and tape it on. As you can see, 
then I'll draw out my outline of where my windows are going to be and, and I've even used a little circle template or something to make, make them round, whatever you want to do. Uh, and once you get the rough shape of where you want the windows to go, I'll bring it up here, then I'll, I'll fold this here inside of the fuselage. Uh, then I'll lay that flat down on the table, cut it out, and then I'll take the, the, the drafting tape off and I'll have something that I can stick down in and have some nice round edges on it and it'll look really nice. We've cut our piece out and you can see that's what it looks like. That's what's going to shape it's going to be. And it was really easy to do. We just traced it and used our uh, use a straight edge and our hobby knife and cut the straight edges and then we use a pair of scissors and just cut the rest out and then after we took the uh, tape off we just rounded and checked to make sure everything's nice and round. Now the thing you have to do is you have to make sure you get this on real straight where you want it and just check it to make sure it looks right. Make sure it's all evenly put on on both sides. It's going to work where you want it to go. Okay, and all you need to do then is just take it and tack it in a couple of places. You're tacking it right there. Pull it up nice and tight, and we'll tack it up here. You can use your heat gun or you can use your iron to uh, set this stuff on with. And I'm not sure which is the easiest. Uh, you can either way it'll work. What I like to do is take the heat gun and you don't want to heat it up a real lot because you don't want it to shrink a lot, but you just want it to stick it down. So I'll take the heat gun, warm up a little section, and then take a Kleenex or something and just rub it in so it sticks. We've got our windshield done, and if you notice, I placed some other things on the airplane. I put the gear back on, put the nose wheel on, put the motor mount on. I got the fuel lines out to the front. I've also started finishing the inside. I put our switches and charging jack on the outside here. And uh, we've also done some work on the inside. We've placed our servo tray back in, and we've uh, placed our receiver battery back down in here under foam. And I'll, I'll worry about when I get done uh, trying to fit this so it doesn't come out and stay solidly in that location, okay? Uh, we've, we've hooked our servos up to our battery, we've plugged in our, our, our battery, our switch, our servos, and we've also just got the push rod tubes just hanging up here on top, just loose. We'll worry about setting those up and getting those wired up a little bit later when we start doing the push rod construction. Uh, one thing I want to note here is that the, the uh, uh, antenna it's a little bit hard to get out of an airplane, and you want to keep it away from all your servos and things like that. And if you look here, you can see that I've got the antenna run up from the receiver around the top, and I just stuck, stuck it down with masking tape. You don't want anything metallic anywhere near that, but you can see the masking tape here with the antenna right in this area here. And I've got it run towards the back of the airplane, and I'll come out. Um, I've put my little nylon piece in there and what I've done is I placed a piece of fuel tubing over the antenna and I made two slits in it. You can see how that kind of goes in there to hold the antenna. You don't want to put any loops or turns in your antenna but this here makes a nice solid connection. So a little, little chunk of fuel tubing works real well and you want a little strain relief as it comes through the hole so that when you pull on this it won't be pulling on your um, receiver wire. Also, the, the tape inside, by being taped down, if it ever does get a good pull, it's got a little bit more resistance pulling the tape off. So get that done. You can put your wing dowels in now, after we're all done with the airplane. You put your wing dowels in, you can glue them in, paint them. I'd paint this one black, I'd paint this one here uh, probably red. And I'm going to do a little bit more decoration on the side with colorings and things like that. Now, remember we were talking about our reference line. What I've done is I've marked in the front and I've marked in the back where my reference line had to go. And I put a piece of that drafting tape, because the drafting tape will not stick to the covering very well, but it holds it on enough. Then I took my long straight edge and just measured from one end to the other the to find the exact straight reference line. Okay? After doing that, back at the back here, I also placed 
some masking tape along the outside on both sides of where the horizontal stabilizer sits. Uh, we need to do some alignment now and getting this thing all straightened up, but we need to get set up for that. So we've made sure that when we glue it, we don't get any glue coming down on our covering on both sides and around the back. Now the horizontal stabilizer we've placed on here, put it exactly where it has to go, set it in. We have our marks, we line up our marks, and generally I just line the front marks up. What I'll do then is I'll take and go from tip to tip with my ruler, and I'll measure from this tip to the center point right up here at the uh, front of the wing, where the back edge of the wing is, and measure it there, and I'll come over the other side and measure it there, and once I get those exactly the same, then I'll place a pin in the back edge in exactly the middle, holding this horizontal stabilizer on. So that'll make sure it's square, and it has to be done. You have to do it with the wing, you have to do it with this also. Now, after, the, after you do that, go underneath there and mark it with masking tape, and I did here, I marked with masking tape where the outside of my body is going to hit the wing, or the uh, horizontal stabilizer, and then I, I went in just a hair and cut off the covering so we can glue the wood to the wood. We couldn't glue the covering, right? So we have to glue wood to wood. So, And then I marked inside here a line around, and, and where this squiggly line is is where I'm going to have to put glue when I glue this on, because there's an open spot in the back end here. Um, what we can do now is we can take our hobby knife or something else, and just to get all set up for gluing, we can make our glue pins and just put little marks and stuff in our glue area where we're going to be gluing, so that we have a nice solid connection when we put our epoxy glue on and glue that together. Also do these, the seat on the fuselage where the horizontal stabilizer goes in. Make all your marks along in there, and now you're about ready to glue that on. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to glue, put the wing on first. And what we need to have here is that take your nose wheel and adjust it up or down so that when you have it on your table, if you, ha if you don't have a real flat table and you're sure the table's not real flat, you could use something like a straight edge or your large sanding bar that you know is straight and lay it like this along your table so you have a perfectly straight edge to work off of. I know my table's straight, so it's a lot easier for me to do it because what I need to do now is I can take this here and measure in the front, and I like using the metric scale because it's a little easier to read, exactly how high it is off the table, and I'll go all the way to the back edge and read it all the way back here and get, so this line here, I want this line to be perfectly parallel with the table. So get that exactly parallel with the table and that'll give us a reference to go for for aligning our airplane up. You can also check and lay your straight edge across your wing saddle here and bend your landing gear a little bit so that this bar here is perfectly level with the table. Measure it up and down on both sides. Measure it out here and measure at the back. And that way we have a reference to go when we put the wing on. Now, when we put the wing on, we're going to have to rubber band this on. We have to put some sealing along the wing so that we don't get any fuel or any junk inside the fuselage where the wing sits on. We also need a cushion. So uh, there's, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can put on, um, they make regular wing seating tape. It's like a, a single-sided adhesive foam tape. And you can stick that all the way around if you want. Um, but you don't get much adjustment doing it that way. I like to do it with the uh, silicone method, and let me show you that. What we have to do is we have to put the wing on first. Now, the way you, you align an aircraft and put the pieces on is you leave all the, the hinge surface off, her surfaces off, leave the ailerons off, the rudder, the, the elevator, leave all that off. And you start off with the wing. You put the wing on first, okay? The wing is always our reference point because that's our flying thing. That's what lifts the airplane. The rest is all kind of superfluous to the wing. The wing is the most important part of the airplane. So let's get that on straight. And how we do that is, is that um, first we take our wing and we cover over the whole bottom surface where the, where the wing is going to meet the fuselage with our clear plastic wrap and tape it down so it's drum tight. Get all the wrinkles out, every wrinkle you can out of it because uh, it'll show up when we, when we get done if you don't. The next thing you do, and see I got that taped over on the top side just so it'll hold it on, and you use your uh, drafting tape or you, find, you don't have to use drafting tape, find some tape that will not tear up your covering so you can put it on and take it off of your covering on your airplane. That's, all you ha that's the only requirement for this type of tape. Next, I ran tape around here and silicone on 
uh, it will not stick and I won't have a mess on my fuselage anywhere where I don't want to. So the glue will only stick here, 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 and around here. The next step to do is to take your silicone and put a healthy bead all the way around your airplane. And you want to cover up this whole surface here. After you get it all the way around the outside edge, you'll notice it's kind of a mess. And you can lick your finger and, and, and touch it and get it you know, a little bit better just so it's all nice and smooth. Um, or anything that's wet, silicone, wet silicone will not stick to anything if it's got water on it So uh, when it's still in the state. So you can take a wet finger, a, a wet tool, a spoon, anything just to smooth this out. Get it nice and smooth and pretty, pretty even all the way around whatever height you decide to build it up to. And the reason we want to make sure that when we put the, the uh, wing on, we have some adjustment. And what we're going to do is that we're going to press the wing down in, air, in certain areas and get it so that it will become out level with our table. And now we take our wing and line up the front, okay? And this is very critical that you do this. I'm going to sit on the table here and move back a little bit so I can get it lined up right. Line it up where it has to go and just touch it in where it goes. Just let it flow down into the silicone where it needs to go. Now as long as we have our tape and our plastic wrap on everything, it will not make a mess. This this model here, I got a little bit of a mess up at the front because I didn't do the, the wing exactly the way I wanted to do it. I did it a little bit different, but that'll make a nice seal for our wing. Now, take your little ruler and measure from the back of each wing tip to the exact center of your tail and get the wing on square. Okay, make sure everything's square. Get it all lined up this way. Triangulate it this way. Triangulate it that way from the other side also. And once you get to that point, then take your, we have our, our gear bent and everything so that our, our wing saddle is straight. Let me put our, our straight edge across there and make sure that was straight. Now we can go out here to the end of our table and if we did it like this, you could probably be easily see easier. We'll just go out to the tips of the table, out here, measure down to the bottom of our wing, measure over on the other side of the bottom of our wing, so that we have the, the wing on straight. And what you'll find is that you can take this and press it down a little bit one side and press it down a little bit more on the other side, and that will straighten the wing out and get it all level. Once you get it to that point, you need to let it set and not move it. Um, if you want, you can take and put a cup, just two rubber bands around the wing, making sure it doesn't move. You can do this before you start moving it around, but this will pull it together a little bit better and, and scrunch down your silicone. Something else you probably should do at this time, too, while you're pressing, is to take your wing and just check to make sure that from the table to the bottom of the wing is the same here as it is here. You can look at your plans. Your plans may have positive incidents. They say positive incidents. They mean that, that from that reference line, it, it should be zero, straight, straight parallel with your table. If you have positive incidents, the front will be up more like this. The, the wing will be pointing up. If you have negative incidents, it'll say like plus two degrees or minus two degrees. It'll be, the wing will be pointed down referencing this line and your table. So if you have positive incidents, you put a little bit more height at the front than you do at the back. And, and you can, if you can do trig, you can figure out what that height would be by this difference, what the two degrees would be difference. And uh, then it'd be, there would be really easy to use a metric scale, just multiply by the certain number of what the length and the width is. You don't have to worry about fractions and 30 seconds and 17 64ths of an inch. You can get a little pretty, pretty complicated. That's why I like metric for some of these measurements. Okay? Once you get that set like that, don't touch it. Try not to bump that at all because that's very important that we keep that straight. Now, as you're doing this, you need to also, if you can do it and do it without touching anything, without bumping anything, you can set it and we can, you can put the tail on. And let's go over how you get the tail set on now, the horizontal stabilizer. We place the horizontal stabilizer back on and something we got to do here first is we have to just check to see if we're close on our 
horizontal line. Same thing with the, ho with the horizontal stabilizer, similar to the wing, is that this may have positive or negative incidence in the horizontal stabilizer, and the plans will show that also. Generally, these items are going to be flat. They're going to be perfectly parallel with this line. So if your table's square again, you can measure in the front and measure it in the back to get that straightened up and make sure it's squared up. Uh, you may have to adjust your saddle a little bit, but we can even do that with the glue. As long as we get it real close, we can, we can do that with the glue. You may want to shave your wood a little bit and make a little bit of, uh, you might find a little bump on your saddle that needs to be shaved off to get that thing to sit flat. And just check to make sure that, that your surfaces are level and everything comes out so when we glue it together, it will come out with a nice glue joint and won't have any problems. Now, if you get your glue pins on here, now put your uh, epoxy glue around here and around here and put a little more on than we had before. We don't want to, we want to rub it in still, but we want to make sure we get a little bit of a build up back here. It's going to be a little bit of weight, I know, but we have to have some way to adjust it and still have good glue contact. So uh, put a little extra glue on each side, uh, each surface and then we'll set that on. We've applied our glue to the horizontal stabilizer and we use the long set epoxy. Don't use a five minute. Uh, I use 15. You may find that 30 minute or even longer would even be better because this has got to be, you got to have some time to play with this, okay? Uh, we've taken our ruler, we measured it so we know it's straight forward and back. We've got our wing, our saddle, everything leveled to the table. If you want, you can take now and measure from here down to the table. You can measure from here down to the table if you want to get this perfectly level with the table. But even a better way, since this thing here is basically related to the wing, okay, if we if we put this horizontal stabilizer on right now just the way it is, notice that this is pointing up like that. See this one's higher than the other one? You can just kind of look at it when you reference it to the wing. Uh, it's just going to have to go like that a little bit. It's going to have to go up a little bit. And what's going to happen is if we leave it like that, we're going to have a built-in turn. So we need to make sure that this is perfectly referenced with the wing. And the way you do that is to let it set and play with it and press on it here and press on it there a little bit just so you get it perfect. Put your eyeball straight back like where we're looking now, straight back at this point. Use one eye and just take the fuselage and raise it up. You can see where the tips of the horizontal stabilizer touch the wing. The right one there touches before the left one using a reference point on the wing. And that'll give you a pretty good indication of whether the plane is the horizontal stabilizer is on straight or not. So I'm going to have to press the horizontal stabilizer a little bit one way or the other to get it so it sets. Now once you get that in position and you're happy that that's perfectly straight and everything's lined up correctly, don't touch it. Even though it's 15 minute epoxy or half hour epoxy, leave it alone. That's all you want to do tonight. Just finish it up, let it set, until that epoxy sets and it, it'll take at least 24 hours to cure. So, that'll, so you'll let this dry, we'll let our silicone set up on our wing and go do something else until tomorrow night. Don't touch it. We've waited 24 hours and our horizontal stabilizer is glued on solid now. You can see it's all glued on solidly. Uh, one little note that is is that if you're, going, if you're going to have your wheels on your airplane, you might put your wheels into uh, some little rolls of tape. That'll keep the plane from rolling around your table and rolling off. If it rolls off the table, you're going to have a mess. Uh, we have to put the vertical fin on now. And notice again, we don't have any uh, movable surfaces on because it's easier to do without them. And the first thing you have to do is you have to set it in your slot. Just set it in your slot and then we have to get it lined up so it points exactly straight towards the front. And you use your large straight edges, and if you had two of these that work even better, you could lay it on both sides. And you just lay them against the side, like that, and, and find where the point is where this thing lines up so it goes perfectly straight towards the front of the airplane. Like now, we also have to, to, even though we have this going straight, we have to get it so it isn't cocked to one side or the other. It has to be perfectly perpendicular to our horizontal stabilizer. And we can do that with triangles. We could put triangles in here, I could put a triangle on this side, I could put a triangle on your side, and then tape them here and tape them here. The final part of the alignment we have to do is with the engine. And we have to make sure that the prop is on straight vertically or with a proper amount of down thrust. Look at your plans and see what they say. And this is the only way I know of to, to adjust the down thrust or the to get the props that's perfect, perfectly uh, perpendicular or at right angles to our reference line. Uh, check it again, R measure your reference line here and in the back and make sure that that line is perfectly parallel to your table or your other reference line. And then make a little piece of wood or I use a bar, steel bar sometime, and you want to put that on kind of like your prop. 
Props are awful hard to measure, so a little solid prop is what we're looking at here, kind of a hard prop. And we want that to make sure it's perfectly in the prop propeller would normally go. And what we're going to do then is we can take and put our, our triangle on here and see how much uh, we have. Okay, I've got a little bit of down thrust in that, just a little bit, about a degree or so. And if you want to measure your down thrust, you can take and use a protractor and set it on there like that and, and measure what your down thrust is and set it to whatever your plans say. Um, I don't have the engine bolted on yet. I have a clamp down with a, uh, a clamp on the other side. So it's holding pretty well to my, my engine mount. Now if you need to, you can take these, these, these graphite composite engine mounts and sand the back side to get the right angle. They're really easy to work with that way. You just set them on a big sandy bar and sand them until you get this right angle here so that you set it up the way your plans call for the proper down thrust. Down thrust means that this, the, the prop is pointing down or this bar is actually leaning this way a little bit. Okay, that's down thrust. Uh, a degree or so of down thrust will not hurt you. It's probably even better in many airplanes to have it. Um, up thrust, if you have any up thrust, get it out. Up thrust is terrible on airplanes, so make sure you get down thrust, not up thrust. Up thrust is bad, get down thrust. We've got the vertical plane of the propeller set up now and make sure you have something solid here. This is just a piece of wood for demonstration purposes. Find something that's straight and will stay solidly on there when you do it. Uh, somebody borrowed my metal bar so I can't show you that one, but this will work fine. Uh, after you get the vertical plane set, we have to get the horizontal plane. We, we, these, this propeller could be pointing to the left or pointing to the right and, and looking at the top, if the propeller is pointing to the right, it's called right thrust and if it's pointing to the left, it's called left thrust. Well, since this propeller ro rotates this direction, right thrust is desirable, left thrust is not. You never want a left thrust in an airplane, but right thrust is all right. And the way you take care of that is, is that, remember our, our piece of wood we used? Well, if you get another piece of wood and make sure it's all straight and everything is going to work out right, uh, get a piece maybe two, two and a half foot long, and then put a mark exactly in the center of that piece of wood, right there. And that's where you put it on your prop shaft, right over the top of your prop and then go out so far toward the end of your wood and put a mark and make those equal distance uh, from this end and then do the other thing on the other end of the piece of wood. So you have a mark, center, and a mark and they're all equal. What we're going to try to do is we're going to tri triangulate this whole structure, kind of like the way we did the wing. And you take and pick a point, take your tape measure, and pick a point at the back end of the wing here, exactly in the center, like maybe the front of the fin or something and measure that distance out to that point and put that and mark that and figure out what that measurement is. Do the other side, measure the other side like this and adjust your motor mount again so that the propeller goes straight, generally straight, or you may want a little bit of right thrust or whatever your plans call for. We need to put our hinges on and uh, I've already done a few of them here. What you need to do is need to get these hinges centered in the middle of the surface. And we need to get them the right space apart so that the, the two pieces are not jammed up real tight against each other, but, but we want as small a gap as possible, but you'll still have free movement of our control surfaces. And what type hinges? Take them and bend them over so that they flatten out like that. And what will happen is, is that that will soften up that center section. Do this about four or five times. You get it nice and soft so it moves easily. And that will make the center section become white. I've even been told that the whites move back and forth a little bit. Okay? So do that first. The next thing to do is, is install your hinges in your surface. And remember I told you to cut out the, the, the covering around that area? Well, you want to cut it around that area so that the glue can go down inside. You can, um, a long time ago we used to take a soda straw and mix up some uh, slow set epoxy and suck up some epoxy into the soda straw, flatten the end, stick it in the slot, and then milk the epoxy into the slot with the soda straw. And you can do that too if you want, but the, since the advent of cyanoracolate glues, it's not really necessary. Uh, take these hinges and sand them. Sand the, the finish off just like we had to do with the plywood so the glue will adhere properly and stick them into your slot. Now what you need to do is shove them, turn them about 90 degrees to the surface and then shove them in all the way. That should space them just about right for what we need. 
and that'll that'll make sure they go in straight and flat and and they'll, they'll be all right that'll also help us to get them centered now just take your cyanoacrylate glue and put a drop right in the crack and be very careful that you only use one drop and that you angle everything so that the glue runs smoothly into the crack and doesn't run over your surface okay the next thing we need to do is we need to uh, install the hinges in the back now what you do there is simply just shove all your hinges in and get them and start from one end stick it in stick it in angle it over get them all say line up as you go across there and this can take a little bit of doing some of these things got four hinges on them and they're a little tough to get in but if you lined everything up right and we've had it all together once and we didn't have any covering on it it should work out all right get it so it's squared up everything's exactly where you want it when you get it exactly where you want it push it back and forth I got to push this over a little bit so it lines up right on the edges here and on both edges now you need to hold the, the fuselage bed down in all the directions and then we need to take and bend the surface up or down as required and hold it at an angle get the surface at an angle so the glue can run down to the slot and do the same thing holding it in an angle run glue down your slot here and try to keep it off of this piece but try to make sure the glue goes in the slot so that it slides into the wood on this side of your, your horizontal stabilizer not your elevator and uh, that's really all you need to do just touch those with a drop of glue flip the whole assembly over put it put a drop of glue on the other side so glue both sides of your hinges with your cyanoacrylate glue not just one ailerons and you're installing ailerons you've got a little bit different situation if you look right here we've got the this is where our wire goes into our aileron and what we need to do is mix up some five minute or fifteen minute epoxy and put glue epoxy glue into this slot and then put some down inside the hole also and uh... what will what happens then is that we'll take and we shove this in the epoxy glue will fill up the extra gap inside that hole where the wire has to turn the uh, aileron and that will make that a lot more solid if we just left that and just shove the wire in, chances are the wire would be uh, a little bit loose and after a while it would eat out that hole as the vibration of the airplane and we could have a, a problem that could punch through the side or we could have a real loose aileron so do that you might want to cover the uh, I got one done up here you can see <coughs> right in this area here I've got one installed and glued on and I'm waiting for the epoxy glue to dry and I'm just wiggling it back and forth making sure everything still stays smooth but I've placed plastic wrap over the joint behind the wire so that the if I get any glue that leaks out it will not glue the wire to the wing it'll just glue the, the wire to the uh, aileron Before we talk about push rods, let's look at what we did up here. We have our antenna wired up and we bring our antenna to the back end. You can put a rubber band down here if you want. I like using a little piece of fuel tubing like we did inside. You just cut two little slots in it like there and run your wire through underneath and through again and put a little pin. I like using a regular household pin right here and pressing it in solidly and that'll make a nice solid place for our, our wire to go and also if it gets hit it'll just pull right out. Um, also up here in the f in the front around the wing saddle after your silicone is dried what you need to do then is pull your tape off and just take a very sharp knife and just trim off this excess silicone that's laying out and flopping around the outside so just get that all pulled off and cut it off you can see it'll make a nice clean edge there that's set up a little harder because it's not quite hard yet um, and when you're looking at, at the back end, the elevator is probably the most critical point on the whole airplane that we have running properly. Um, we have to make sure that, let's say you're doing a loop. When you're doing a loop, you pull up elevator, and as the plane comes around, you can see the wind's going to be hitting this surface right here and trying to flatten it out. No matter what you're doing, the wind will always be trying to flatten out your elevator or mm -hmm. there. Well, if your push rod system isn't strong enough, your the wind will be able to push that flat or change it somewhat from where you think it's supposed to be and where you have it set with your transmitter control and you can have a problem. If the backside of a loop you get going too fast it flattens out the elevator somewhat and you may not have enough, enough elevator to pull out of your loop so 
we want nice solid push rod structures and if you use something like this this would be just a flexible rod if you just had it held at the back end and held at the front end and you pushed on and the wind pushed on your push rod you can see what would happen the rod would give first it would bend like this and you would lose your control so if you're going to use these plastic ones and I don't believe me I don't recommend them but a lot of people still want to use them back here for elevators and rudders. Rudders not so bad, but elevator I really don't think it's a good idea. You've got to hold this tubing every couple of inches, like every former location, so that it cannot flex. So it has a, a straight shot and it's, it, it cannot flex. It has, it has a little bit of flex between the places you hold it, but it has to be held solidly. And, and anytime you put this uh, outside tubing in, make sure that you sand this very well and glue it in really well with cyanoacrylate glue and, and baking soda or epoxy or something else. I, even, I would even drill uh, the bulkheads to have this stuff go through. Uh, so that's what we have to get to with our push rods. Now, there's a lot of different types of push rods. And uh, here's probably the old classic one. This is your standard balsa wood or uh, 5 16 quarter inch square balsa wood. And what you do here is, is that you drill a hole and I have one here that's made up. You drill a hole and you bend your wire something like that. We have your Z bend in one end and then you have a, just a bend down the other end. Now on the end of your wire and your wood you drill a hole and put a slot so this thing will sit solidly in there and you press it in pretty much flush. Uh, I'd even take cyanoacrylate glue and tack this in so it doesn't move on me and then wrap it up totally neatly with uh, your strong thread and I like to coat this entire area with epoxy once we get done with that. Uh, try to keep them looking nice. Here's a couple I made many many years ago and these are pretty much of a mess. You can see how much glue there is on there. The wires got bends in it. The wires way too long for what we need and uh, you can see how sloppy some of these things look. So try to do a neat job when you do them. I just keep these around for demonstration purposes. Uh, you want this end here the end that goes into your servo to be as short as possible. We don't need a lot of wire sticking out there and the less wire you have the more rigid that push rod will become pushing and pulling and you'll have a lot less trouble, a lot less flex in your push rod system. So all you have to do when you're doing that is take a look at your, your servo arm. When you put this in, move this out of the way, you want only enough wire sticking out that, that when you go from one end to the other of the throw it will not hit anything and that's all that we really care about and for most cases this is about an inch and that's more than enough you can see that will not hit anything and that will work just fine um, if there are other ways to make these bends you can put a Z bend up here uh, another approved way of doing it is to bend a 90 degree angle in the wire and put a wheel collar on that works really well too but you've got to make sure that you get that wheel collar nice and tight uh, those are about the only two methods that are approved for pylon racing is a Z-bend or one of these 90 degree bend wires. So, so try to use those if you can on your servo ends of all your, your, your control surfaces, especially your elevator, your rudder, the things that go to actual, actual push rods. Um, another type of push rod that I really enjoy is the fiberglass aero shaft. This is a quarter inch inside diameter aero shaft and basically all you do is you drill a hole in your aero shaft, punch your wire up through it, then you make a little plug out of a quarter inch dowel and cut a groove in it. And once you get that groove cut, it'll slide right in over your wire and you just push it all the way in, and coat it up with epoxy glue, sand it, whatever you have to do, shove it all the way in and that will make a real solid nice push rod. These things here will not flex. Um, you can buy these from various manufacturers in the hobby industry. Uh, some have fancy plugs that go on the end, all sorts of other good stuff they do to you. But I found that <clears throat> these are quite serviceable like this, and I buy these at the uh, uh, archery store. These are, that's why I call them aero shafts, because that's exactly what they are. They're, they're fiberglass aero shafts. They're, they're a little heavier, but the higher performance airplane you have, the more you're going to want to use something that's really stiff like this. The balsa wood ones are pretty stiff. If you can use the balsa wood ones, and these are the ones that usually come in most kits, you can, they have you make them up yourself. Uh, make sure you get really hard wood. Don't get any soft wood to use for push rods. Make sure they're really, really tough and stiff and hard. And if you want, you can even soak this down with cyanoacrylate glue just to make it totally hard and solid. You can also use uh, 
just a, a dowel, different diameter dowels. These get a little heavier, but they're also a little more flexible because they're not a, a tube. A tube structure is very strong like these aero shafts, but a solid structure is not real strong. So uh, I've seen a lot of people use these, and these work okay too, but I wouldn't use them on a real big airplane. So that's basically the, the main things about, about uh, uh, push rods. The, another thing that we have here is we have the set screw type of clevis mount. And this, this type here is not to be used for um, elevators and rudders and things like that. Just use these strictly for your throttle and your uh, nose wheel and other auxiliary systems because if that set screw ever comes loose this wire here will come right out and that could cause a major problem. Um, in fact I wrecked an airplane using one of these. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people out, out the field where I, where I live and uh, they said well I use those all the time and never had a problem. I guess the, they're lucky. The, they're, they're gonna have a problem it's just a matter of when. If, the, if this isn't approved for pylon racing I won't use it because it's not a, uh, a good way to, to make your connections. They're just not totally secure. The thing to remember about making push rods is that when you put them together, we only want one adjustment. If you have by your servo end on this end, your Z-bin, that cannot turn, right? Because it's held there and it cannot turn. You put your adjustment at the other end, so you have one adjustment. And you can screw that in and out and lock it down with your, your, your nut. So never have two adjustments. What will happen is, is that you could actually have this rod in the air turn start turning and it could screw out totally out of out of your control horn or clevis on one of the ends if you had two adjustments. So no matter what you do, one adjustment only. We still haven't mounted our engine on the airplane yet. It's still kind of just clamped on there because we're going to use that for balancing in the next step here. Uh, but let's talk about propellers for a few minutes. Propellers come in all shapes and sizes, so do spinners, spinner nuts, everything like that. And the one thing that's very important to know is that they have to be balanced. Now, here's your standard wood air, wood propeller, and if you tighten this into your balancer and hold it loosely between your fingers, you'll notice that one of the blades will drop, okay? Always that blade drops. Now, we have to get that so that when you do that, it'll stay there. It'll be just be, it'll be like this. It'll stay right there and will not move. What you do is the easiest thing to do is just take your hobby knife and scrape off some of the varnish on the back side of the blade. You'll find that that works very easily. You don't do the front. Never touch the front of the blade. See, that's an airfoil shape and it creates lift or forward lift basically. So if you do the front, you'll change the, the airfoil shape. So scrape the back side of the blade and, get, and keep doing it and keep doing it until you get the thing so it'll, it'll balance properly. And that's a little bit, a little bit heavy. It needs a little more. We'll leave that for now. Uh, if you're flying for the first time, you might want to use one of these uh, graphite composite or fiberglass, whatever type of uh, these these ones that are made out of something besides wood. These are made in a mold, and this is a master air screw. And for a 40 size engine, we're going to put a 10.6 on there. Um, the one thing to remember about these is that these are made in a mold and when, when they take the mold apart there are parting lines right along the edges where they come out of the mold at. And these are very, very sharp. So before you do any balancing or anything else with these propellers, make sure you take your sandpaper and sand the edges and get all that sharp edge off of these things around the tips and everything. Because what will happen is, is you'll just cut your fingers off really bad if you don't get them sanded properly. Then after you get done, do the same thing. Balance the propeller. With these, you can use the knife also, or you can even use sandpaper on the back side of your heavy blade. So keep doing it, and you can see here this, this little tool here works really nice. You just let go of it. There's no doubt about which blade's heavier, is there? It's this blade here. No matter where you set it at, it should be heavy. Get that there so it stays right where you, where you set it, if you set it across like that. Okay? Enough about propellers. Let's talk about spinners. If you're going to put your cowl on your airplane, and this is the cowl here, you're going to have to cut it out and block, put some blocks in to screw it onto your firewall and things like that and cut off your muffler and everything. Uh, and you may want to put a spinner on it. And there comes a metal types like this. These are pretty heavy and they're a little expensive. Uh, metal ones. Here's a, a plastic one. This plastic one has even been painted. I painted that to match the color of another airplane. 
if you're going to use a spinner and paint it, you're going to have to start your engine by hand because the minute you touch this electric starter, you're going to be tearing up all your paint job. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, other types of spinner nuts are, here's one here, this is uh, a little safety nut and this will screw on and you put a rod through the hole there and it will just uh, tighten onto your prop shaft. Uh, Higley makes these ones here, this is a Higley hub and this one is uh, made of aluminum and you just tighten that on with a wrench or you can put a, a wire through the, the hole. Also for balancing, it's about, oh, I guess three or four times the weight of, of what that aluminum one is. And I like using these for balancing a lot of airplanes. You can put a starter on these and, and you don't have to worry about it. Make sure that when you put your propellers on that you get them tight. And uh, one more thing, this is a spacer that goes with one of the aluminum ones here. And you have to put that in there and tighten that down. Um, get them on tight. Make sure you tighten them about as tight as you can get them by hand. I mean, don't over-wrench them. If you use one of these tools here and tighten it just about as tight as you can get it by hand, uh, that should be tight enough. A lot of people have trouble with their, with their, they're, they're afraid of over-tightening these, and, and yes, you don't want to over-tighten them, but you want to make sure they're not going to come loose. So if you have a question about how tight your prop hub is, ask somebody who knows before you actually fly your airplane. This is not the way to put your propeller on your airplane. Never do this. This is the shaft that comes out of the engine and just the washer and the nut. That's not an approved way and it even violates the AMA safety code. This is a dangerous type of a situation. We'd never want that. You always want some kind of a blunt front on your propeller, whether it be that or something like that. So make sure you never do that. Um, if you find it necessary to drill out the back side, or let's say your shaft size of your engine is not right for your propeller, and you have to make this hole in here larger, make sure you use a standard prop reamer. This is a stepped reamer that comes in different sizes. You can get it and you use that for reaming out your holes. If you use anything else, this hole could get eccentric and not straight and it, w it will not sit right on your prop shaft and that will create, vi create vibration also. So these things are very important to know. The less vibration we have, the smoother and more power we'll get out of our engine and the less trouble we'll have with our radio system as we're flying our airplane. Um, if you're using a wood airplane and you ever have a little ding, uh, you did have a rough landing, check over your propeller real good, look for cracks, bend it a little bit, make sure there's no splits in, in, in the grain or anything like that. If there is, throw it away, get a new one. These are not that expensive and if you have a, a prop come apart while you're trying to start it, it could fly off and hurt somebody. Um, one other final note and that is when you're putting your propeller on, try to put your propeller on so that, that the compression, when you hit the compression, is right here. Put your prop on this way. So if you're flying along and the engine's spinning and the propeller's spinning and it stops for some reason, the propeller will not stop with the prop down. It'll stop with it sideways. And then when you come in the land, you have less chance of hitting your prop on the ground because most likely it'll stop and hit like that and then the engine will stop right at the edge of the compression stroke. So do those things and you'll have uh, no trouble with propellers. Your, your engines and your radials will last longer and you'll really have an enjoyable time. We've put our push rods in, we've got everything completed inside, and I'll show a little bit more about that later. But what we need to do now is we need to get this engine mounted and we need to get things balanced. So when we have everything put together, put the prop on, put whatever nut on the front you're going to use, and we still have our motor mount here just loosely set on. We can slide the engine forward and back. I got a little clamp holding it. The clamp doesn't weigh very much, so it shouldn't affect things. What you need to do now is look at your plans, and right here on your plans it'll show your balance point it'll say balance point or it'll say CG or something like that and what you need to remember is that that the front one is where you want to be at with a new airplane even though they give you this range here always balance to the front one and a little bit farther forward even wouldn't hurt much but if you get back any farther in here if you balance back in here the plane's going to be real squirrely and it's going to be very difficult and unstable and could be dangerous to fly so make sure you get this done properly and after you initially test fly your airplane with it forward then you can remove some of your weight to get it back to the back for a little more performance and a little more aerobatic capabilities. But always start at the front mark when you're balancing your airplane. And, and there's lots of ways you can do that. I've seen use all sorts of jigs you can buy. There's uh, various things you can do uh, with the airplane. But the easiest way is to just take those two points and on the bottom side of your wing on both sides, right back in here, mark those two points with a little piece of tape or something so you know where they're at. Measure back from the leading edge of your wing and just take your fingers and lift up the airplane 
and you'll find that, that the airplane will fall back, or it'll fall forward, it'll fall back when you put your fingers on those two points. And what you want is, is when it's balanced, those two, um, that reference line that we have on the side of the fuselage will be perfectly parallel to your table, or perfectly parable, parallel or, or level, basically. And what you'll have to do is you'll have to put up one of these big brass heavy hubs on to add the weight here. Um, you can move your motor mount out as far as you can get because we want to minimize the amount of weight we're going to be adding. So uh, I need a little more weight, so I'm going to slide the motor mount all the way out, and then I'll bolt my engine in with it all the way out because you never know. But uh, that's, how, that's why we left that loose. If you want to put it in earlier, in an earlier step, and bolt your engine in, that's fine. But just plan on having to add a little more lead than you, than you might need. Uh, if you add weight, you can drill down here, you can, you can mount some lead here on your firewall, you can put it inside, we have all that foam up around the fuel tank, you could wrap up some lead in, a, in, a, in some foam and shove it up in there, and that'll work also, and that's, that's a common way people do it. People, um, if you're using a spinner, you can buy lead washers that go on your spinner, I think Prather makes them. Uh, various ways you can add lead, but the, keep in mind that the farther forward you get the lead, the less lead it's going to take since our, our balance point, our moment arm, from, from our balance point to our weight is greater. That's why we like to keep the tail nice and light. We don't want to put any extra weight back there. So that takes care of balancing. We've gotten everything put inside, and I want to show you what we did with the push rods and things like that. The first thing I want to show you is the back end. This is how we had to come out for the rudder. We had to make a, a bend and a z-bend and it, the wire came out in here and it had to bend up and then go like that. We don't want to get a, a straight 90 degree angle but try to keep that angle as, as low as possible so we come back and, and fit into our thing. We also have our fuel tubing over our clevis. I use a nylon one back here and I don't like this much rod but on this type of airplane there's not much you can do about it. Uh, that runs into our fiberglass push rods and I use those inside this airplane. If you look inside they're there's how we have our controls mounted. And here's our elevator, a little short piece of wire going up to our, straighten it around so you can see a little easier. Can't hold it. There's our wire going to our little push rod. And you can see how nicely that'll work when I push the uh, controls. Doesn't hit anything. There is no slop, and we'll never have a problem with that. That'll work perfectly. Here's our rudder. It's also pushing the nose wheel. See how the nose wheel is on the opposite side? What I did was I glued a block in here, right in here, that held the outer tubing. Then I, I used wire and, and the uh, screw and set screw type ones for the, the uh, rudder uh, nose wheel. And you see how nothing should hit. Now the throttles are a problem. Um, if you set the throttle up the way I show you here, it should work just fine. What happens is, is that you have trouble getting the arc right. Uh, if you had endpoint adjustments on your, on your throttle servo, it would be real easy to set the throttle up. But if you set it up like this, where you have a long wire running out to here and you, and you hold the front end here so this piece of wire can flex this way and set your throttle up so, so low idle. There we go, there's low idle. That's all the way down. Um, low idle, low trim on the, on the throttle also. And about in that position. Then your high, that there would be your high idle. I'm just working the trim lever. That should be your starting range, somewhere in there. And if you go all the way like that, your engine will die with your barrel is totally closed. Um, then what happens is, you say you're right about there with your normal throttle running idle. Then when you go full throttle, it'll go up like that. And what happens is if this arc isn't right, if this uh, length of wire is not right, um, it'll allow, the wire will, will be allowed to push over this way and come around the arc, and you won't have much extra throw or force put on your servo. In fact, I'd like to have this even here a little bit farther up in this area so that I get unload this wire because it'll be just pushing across the top of the arc like that and not actually pushing and jamming the controls. I have to adjust this. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's it's got a buzz to it. I'm on high throttle and high idle. Let me see if I can, I can make it. If you can hear that sound, that means I have a jammed servo. Now, if I threw, flew around like that all the time, the engine would probably, or the radio would probably, the batteries would go dead 
uh, pretty quick. So you got to get rid of all those noises, all those buzzing noises you got to get rid of. And you should do that with your throttle, do it with your rudder, push your rudder all directions and hold it full throw all directions and make sure that it doesn't buzz anywhere where you hold it full control. Same with your elevator. Get rid of all the buzzes. Adjust your clevises, adjust your push rods, whatever you have to do to get rid of them. And that's what we have inside here. We've mounted our switch and our servos and everything is held down there. The push rod over the top of the radio held the receiver down. So that should be pretty well. We don't have to worry about that coming out. It can't come out past these wires and it can't move around. And, and one thing you can do to, to check is just take your plane and just shake it. Just shake your, your, your radio. Turn it upside down, bang it, shake it a little bit and make sure nothing moves. Um, we have our nose wheel set up in the front. I've got my clamp still on here. I haven't bolted my engine in yet. But if you look right up here, you want to set the straight ahead position with the arm a little bit forward so that it, when, when it, it goes towards the back it has room to go. That would be full left, full right. And I could even move that forward a little bit farther. The one thing to remember is that on this wire right here where you have to put the set screw in, let me take this out so you can see a little easier. You have to put a set screw in right here to hold this wheel on your, on your arm. Wherever you put that set screw, make sure you take your file and file a flat spot on there. Otherwise, what will happen is this wheel will just come loose and it will just turn and it will get sloppy. And this will find a, a leveling point and then lock it into that position so it can't turn. It's like a keyway uh, and that should take care of any problems with your nose wheel. Same like if you use any kind of a shaft or wheel collar. Um, I guess anytime you put a wheel collar on or a set screw into a wire shaft, file a flat spot. It's just a good idea, a good way to have your airplane put in. We're basically done with the airplane. You can see we've got everything mounted, everything's put together, we've, we've adjusted everything. And now, just make sure that your, your controls work the right way. That uh, when you pull back on the stick, the elevator goes up. When you push the left aileron to the left, that the left aileron goes up. That's an easy way to remember. Left is left up on your ailerons. Uh, left rudder moves the rudder, the back end of the rudder to the left. It also should move the front of the nose wheel to the left. Uh, low throttle, high throttle, low throttle, high throttle. And with these servo reversing switches it's real easy. Just flip them the other way and you don't have to worry about it. Um, as far as how much throw to give each one of these uh, controls, the only thing I can tell you is check your book, your building instructions for your airplane you're building and set them up according to what they say. They've done a lot of testing on these airplanes and they know what they're supposed to be. So uh, how you adjust those is move your move your servo, your clevises in and out on your horns, move your, your arms in and out on your servos and that'll take care of that. You should be able to get them pretty close. Uh, don't worry if there's a, if you can't get them exact. Just get them as close as you possibly can with the with the controls and, and the, the holes in your horns and the holes in your servos that you have available. Um, use a different servo arm if you have to to get that done. The Before we finish up, a couple more things. The AMA requires that you have an identification card in your plane. And uh, what this is, is this says that you... Um, the official identification of the Academy Model Aeronautics. And you fill it out, put your license number, name, address, whatever else on there. And uh, SIG Manufacturing actually supplies these in, in the kits. Uh, I don't know if some of the other ones do or not, but they have always always have. And once you get this all filled out, you can take and just squirt a little bit of cyanoacrylate, not cyanoacrylate, put your 3M77 on the back side, and just stick it to the inside of your fuselage somewhere where you have a clear surface area. So that's, that's all you have to do for that. Another thing they require is that on your right wing panel back here somewhere, your AMA number, should, should say AMA 63524, whatever your number is, should be in two inch wide letters, high letters all the way across your wing. That's a requirement. The only planes that don't have that requirement are scale aircraft, but no sport planes that must be that way. Now if you notice, I don't have enough rubber bands on this airplane. I've only got two, one this way and one that way. You should take and put eight to ten rubber bands on your wing whenever you fly. Don't ever fly with less than that. Uh, eight would be the minimum. And what, what I do is I put them on first, start from the back, pull them up, and bring them around, and hook them on. You may find that since this is balsa wood back here and a little soft, you may want to take a little piece of plywood and uh, 
glue it on back there and cover it. Make Cover it like a separate piece and glue it on just to hold that area so it doesn't bend that wood down right back here and back here. The rubber bands go around and make a sharp 90 degree bend down. So put um, three rubber bands on here, three rubber bands on this side. The last two, put them on crisscross like this. That'll help hold those rubber bands on. Make sure that when you get done that you have your center here, your center mark back here so that the wing goes on the same place all the time. Um, get back and look at it from the back end and look at it and make sure that, that you do the old uh, test there on getting your horizontal stabilizer straight. Just look at it with your eye, make it go up, make sure that every time you fly that those things do line up because that'll give you a squirrely airplane if you don't. And just make sure that that's all straight. Uh, check your balance from time to time. Uh, before you go out and fly, every time I go out and fly, I take and I make sure that all my screws that are in my servos are all tight. Check those. Make sure they're all tight. Now, if you want, you can decorate this. You can put, uh, uh, kind of like the way we did the wind windshield, I'm going to put some uh, white stripes and things on the wing, just so I know which is the right side up and which is upside down. So if I'm upside down, I know the difference. And I'll put, just on the top side, I'll put, and uh, you can use trim tape, you can use anything you want to decorate it with. It's really up to you. Uh, you can do it with just the, the covering method, but you have to be real careful and use a very low heat. So, I hope you've enjoyed building this airplane with me. Um, I had a great time doing it. It's a lot of work. It is. I won't kid you. It has been a lot of work. But it's well worth it because you've taken a box of wood and you've created something that flies and is really a marvel in today's society. Before we leave, a couple things that might be a little more interesting is uh, I suggest you go upstairs, sit in front of the TV and just fly your airplane. Get, get used to the controls and see how much it takes to move them, just to get used to where everything's at and how everything works and what everything does. Uh, it also is beneficial too to just sit there and do this whenever you're sitting doing nothing uh, before you go out to fly for the first time. What this will do is this will exercise all your servos, your sticks, and it'll also cycle your batteries. And I would, I would keep doing this and run my batteries down until the, the servos stop moving. Uh, if, you have a, if you have an expanded scale voltmeter that you can plug into here, you might run it down to about 4.4 volts or 1.1 volt per cell. And that will allow your batteries to cycle down and, and allow them to charge up better. Um, that should be about all we have to discuss. Happy flying. Due to the various ways people build airplanes, a uh, plane video cannot be responsible for how you build your airplane or how you fly it. We can accept no liability for any damages resulting from any operation or flight of your aircraft. Uh, this tape is strictly for informational purposes, and uh, if you have any questions, contact the AMA or your local flying club for more information or more assistance. It's up to you to determine whether the ideas presented here and the materials and procedures are used are suitable for your product. This tape is produced by Plain Video.